The following program is made possible by a grant from the New York Community Trust and with public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts. Sir. 1BA, Riesbay. Sir. 1BB, Yanofsky. Sir. 2A, Rosencrantz. Sir. 2B, All White. Sir. 3A, Calter. Sir. 3B, Tricochi. Mudge. Sir. 4B, H. Green. Sir. 5A. Oh, give me attention. Last night, we had a suicide. Sometimes this has a depressing effect on the inmate population and can result in a wave of incidents such as this. We must pay particular attention to the 4 to 12 tour, 12 day tour, patrol, patrol properly, patrol your tours, particularly on the 12 to 8. You'll find an inmate is not sleeping. Watch him, watch him very carefully. That's a potential suicide, okay? Expect you to do your job. All right. All right, men, take your post. So two. Each day, a, uh, 
an area of the institution is searched. Uh, these are non-scheduled searches. Uh, I guess you, you would call them spot checks, you know, just to keep the inmates off balance so they don't know where we're going to search on any given time. What we're looking for on these searches is contraband. Uh, contraband uh, uh, involves drugs, weapons, um, anything that, that is uh, not conducive to the good order of the institution. Gonna look through your things, look at your things in neat, you know, don't throw your things around like they they ain't worth nothing, you know, like you're garbage, you know. You know, they should have some respect on you, you know, you you're a person, you know. Not an animal, you know, like the way they make you feel like you're an animal, the way they throw your things around, you Tell him I'm in Ragaz Island. They, they picked me up from up there today. All right? Tell him definitely don't let me down to bring her up here so they can get this shit thrown out. All right? And uh, like, you don't have to come because you got to be there Friday, right? So that, that way you don't have to be off two days. Everything okay, huh? The baby's okay? Give me a number. 343, 145. Go to Julio. Go to Julio. That's all the money you have, man? You don't have any more money? That's all you have, eh? That's all I got, yeah. Yeah, I'm broke. I got arrested Saturday, Saturday morning. I stayed in the precinct until Sunday evening and went to court. I went to court that night. And the uh, only thing I did was w walk into a store that was open to the public. And I went into the bathroom that said no admittance, employees only. And they gave me a burglary for that. Not criminal trespass, but a burglary of a $500 bond. I don't have no, I don't have no job out there. I'm self-employed. I wash cars for a living. And I stopped people. Yo, mister, you want your car washed for 2 $3? Just to get something to eat and to pay my hotel room. You know? But they gave me a $500 bond for that. I mean, I haven't been convicted of no crime yet. I've only been accused. And I don't understand why I have to be going through all these these different changes. Like, you know, as so I'm a married man with two kids, you know, I got a job and going to school. It's really hard to be coming, you know, sacrificing time to come down and sit through all this, you know. And now they're taking away a day from me. And uh, it's, it really don't help. It really doesn't help. How long do you think you're going to be out here now? Uh, well, from the looks of it, I'm hoping no longer than 24 hours. But uh, it's never no telling. Once they, once they confiscate the, the human body, they can keep you as long as they want. Two at a time. Two at a time. Take everything off, put it on the table there. Two at a time, fellas. Two at a time. That's four walk out here already. Two. Turn around. 
Spread your cheeks, put your feet up. Put the shots back on. Let's take the overall criminal justice system. In this city, the police department is completely out of proportion with the correction department. The police department compared to us is so massive that they can lock up more people than we can possibly think of dealing with. And we don't have the ability, the, the right or the authority to release anybody. And the courts are not gonna release anybody. And these people, the court set their bell so high that it's impossible for them to even think about getting out. Half of the people in here do not work. Those that do work only have enough money, you understand, to support their families. So how in the hell the kind of man with a family and two kids afford to go in front of a judge and pay a judge a $5,000 cash bail or a $25,000 bail when he don't make but $130 or $140 a week. It's totally impossible, man. And they know it's impossible. So that, that's not a bail. That's like telling you you're guilty. You're coming to jail anyway, you know? Uh, there's no requirement that bail be fixed in an amount that a defendant can, be, uh, can make. There's no requirement that a defendant be out pending trial. If you had that requirement, nobody would be in jail pending trial. Now, obviously, in fixing a bail decision, there ought to be, I suppose, uh, all things being equal, a preference for release in advance of a finding of guilty than, uh, rather than a, pr a preference for retaining the defendant. But there are many cases where it is clear that unless a bail is fixed in a substantial amount, the defendant may very well flee the jurisdiction. If the law provides that bail is not a device to keep a person in jail, quite to the contrary, it's in order to ensure your liberty until a jury has found you guilty. See, but yet the DA can postpone your trial for months and months and months, and every time you go to court, well, I've been here six or seven months, uh, can I get a bail reduction? No. You understand? That's ridiculous. All they got to do is apply. A, they got laws on their books which provide for bail jumping, and it's an E felony. So why the high, ridiculous bail? The Constitution says excessive bail under the Eighth Amendment. Excessive bail shall not be set. That's all it says. It's a one sentence. Now, the courts have interpreted it, uh, interpreted that phrase, excessive bail shall not be set. And that is true. Uh, and the court will, uh, will strike down that which it believes to be excessive. But again, excessive compared to the crime, the background of the defendant, the strength of the case, et cetera. There are certainly those who should be separated from society. But when they're being separated, they should be separated according to some guidelines and with the recognition that that is what is being done, not with the hypocrisy and the false front of sitting $50,000 bail uh, for someone uh, who will never see $50,000 in their life. Reasonable bail to me, if a man is poor, and he has no money at all, then penny, then a penny bail is unreasonable. Unless there's some benefactor in the audience who's going to come forward and post bail. Um, if I f believe, on the basis of the papers I have before me in my questioning of a defendant, that there's no reason to fear that he will flee to Algiers or join Vesco in the Caribbean, then my experience has been that there should be no bail. And if that man refuses to come back to court, whether out of fear, ignorance, or any other circumstance, generally, he can be found in the very neighborhood where he was arrested, which is generally his own neighborhood. But it is wholly in violation of all of our tenets and our jurisprudence to keep somebody in jail before he's convicted if we honor the presumption of innocence.
which all too often is not honored. The system is, uh, is geared to have one type of inmate here. That's the indigent black and Hispanic. If the man is poor and can't make bail, he's going to be here, whether he's innocent or whatever. A B side officers, it's now time for the official lockdown. It's now time for the official lockdown. Let me stand by yourself for the lockdown. shop, law library, and uh, visits, and whatever else may come up. In HDM itself, they average like one stabbing a week, an assault on a CO once a week, and you're locked behind the gate. No weapons whatsoever, and the only, the only weapon you has, have is your personality and your wit. The whole game is to get over. Who can get over the best? The inmates are always trying to get over on you, you know, so they can run an extra phone call, run to the library, run on a visit, <clears throat> run extra food. And you got to try to decipher all this and see who's telling the truth, who ain't. You got to try to get over on him saying, yeah, yeah, you'll get it, you'll get it. <laughs> and you're not sure if he's going to get it. I don't feel safe in here. Anything can happen to me. Other than that, you know, I could deal with it. I've been here before. I was here when they had a riot, so I, I know what can happen to a person while they, you know, incarcerated here. That's the only thing that I really fear, because they just have me. They don't have my mind, really. I'm just, I just in fear of my physical body while I'm here. Anything can happen. The structure of this institution basically is a warehouse. It's uh, three tiers high, uh, 40 cells on a tier, 240 cells to a cell block. I believe that the physical structure of this building isn't even fit for sentenced inmates doing a, a definite uh, sentence. I think that what you're talking about is almost a devil's island. But the conditions themselves uh, certainly are deplorable under any standards that you want to apply. Unsanitary conditions, um, toilets that don't work, showers that don't work, uh, cell blocks with a noise level that is louder than the New York City subway system, except it's on a 16-hour-a-day um, basis that that noise level uh, remains the same. Um, overcrowded conditions, um, poor sanitary um, conditions in the sense of personal hygiene, um, the ability to change clothing, the ability to uh, have toothpaste and uh, soap and towels and clean sheets and pillowcases and uh, bed mattresses. Um, overall, uh, these things are, are items that are very often not looked at uh, or given any consideration by the, by the city through the Department of Correction. The, the people who are being held in our jails awaiting trial are not convicts. And if they had the $500 or $50,000 that a judge had set for bail, they would not be there. 
And given that case, the conditions of confinement for people who are being held awaiting trial, uh, according to the Constitution and the interpretations of the Constitution, should be no different than those for people who are out, other than to assure their appearance at trial. Well, the very fact that the courts classify them as detainees does create a problem. As I said before, that they are incarcerated until due process, but the courts uh, maintain that they are entitled to all the privileges of uh, an individual in outside society, and that's a, a difficult task to perform. Uh, security is paramount, and uh, sometimes uh, the privileges is conflict with this basic security. There's only three officers for this whole block, and on each side is 120 inmates. Now, three officers control this. So if there's a fight in the front of the block, somebody can be getting stabbed in the back, and they'll never know it. They'll never know. Somebody can be thrown off a chair. And there's people in here that's facing lots and lots of time that at any given time they can just snap. Well, we think there might be some trouble in seven block. No, we don't know yet, so we're just uh, waiting around just in case there is something going on. It's about lock-in time now, so uh, we're waiting to see what's going to happen on the lock-in, if there will be some kind of a misunderstanding in that particular way. We've had problems down there, fights, uh, found many weapons down there, possibly about seven, eight weapons in the last day and a half on that particular section. So this is usually an indication of something like this. over there I don't even know him that well right somebody was saying something about him I don't know what happened and all of a sudden a bright thought broke out I try to help break it up when anything happens and it turned out he came out with a razor blade started swinging I said oh my god what's wrong with you and all of a sudden the guys you know they try to knock him out the way but uh he attacked me. I don't see no reason why. You, know? you don't know why the fight broke out? I don't know why the fight broke out or anything, but he, all of a sudden he just came out with razor blades and started attacking. Some of the guys, he attacked me. Got another wound up here. That's even a deeper gash, you know. <laughs> it surprised me. Let's go. Get him down to the clinic right away. I don't care what coach you got. come to jail here, it's like becoming, coming to a graveyard. We did as far as society is concerned. The courts are deaf on us. Our family and friends a lot of time give up on us too. 
you know, a letter here, a letter there once in a while. But other than that, all we got is ourselves to depend on each other to help us out, try to learn as much law as we can to get our freedom back. Cuando tú vas a corte, sabes que te dan uno y tú no, 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 he doesn't interpret, you know, he doesn't interpret exactly, he doesn't, he doesn't interpret what, exactly what he says. In other words, he says something else, you know, and I, and you said something about the law library before, right? Yeah. Uh, he says that, uh, that also, you know, he, it's, you know, he finds it, <clears throat> excuse me, he finds it difficult, you know, like to help himself as far as uh, his case is concerned, you know, and getting information because being that he speaks Spanish and very little English, he doesn't read English and he doesn't write English, it, you know, it's, it's a problem, you know, to go over there and, and, and look up cases and, and just, you know, help himself. Como, como yo, que yo, just like I've been to look here, my real name is Pedro Castro because I use Castro, that's my father's name. I said my name, and they got me here, Pedro Dias. That is wrong because in Presidio, they maybe put me, oh, you, you, you mean a falsification, you know? That is wrong. I've been told, and I've been seeing the lawyer up here, look here, my name, Pedro Castro, is not Dias. Well, they can. I can't do nothing about it because I, I don't understand where am I going and where am I can go. I don't know. I just been told my name is Castro. It's not Dias. My name is Castro. Dias is my mother's name. My name is Castro. But they have them like this. They don't fix them on, and I don't know what, what. I don't understand. Since I've been in here a total of almost three weeks, I haven't seen my legal aid. The most I've seen them was five minutes at the court and all I could do was talk to him about five minutes to tell him about my case. Now, he was supposed to have been here three times, which he promised me, and neither one of those three times he appeared. So, I am still waiting here, and I'm going to court within the next few days, and my legal aid don't know much about me or my case. And all I'm allowed is still another five minutes to talk to him while I'm at court before I see the judge. Fifty men in one bullpen. Isn't it crazy? You know what I mean? I mean, at least they can do uh, make accommodations a little better or move us around or something like that. You know. When do you think you're gonna get to see your legal aid attorney? When do I get to see a legal aid attorney? Just before you step into the, uh, the courtroom. That's when you see him. Maybe 40 or 50 cases at a time. Mm -hmm. That's what I carry there. Those cases include cases awaiting trial, cases uh, awaiting sentence, and uh, cases in the very early stages and very late stages. So uh, uh, it's more than enough to keep me busy. Do you feel generally that you're able to deal with your clients' cases effectively under the prevailing conditions? Well, it's. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, one of the skills involved in the job is to be effective under the prevailing conditions. Conditions are terrible here. Uh, the people are uh, not uh, take well taken care of. The cells are filthy. Uh, they're upset, and you don't blame them. And uh, it's overcrowded. Uh, it's noisy. It's it's not at all uh, good. They're not good conditions at all. Is it possible to be effective? It's possible to be effective as you can uh, in these conditions. Uh, I waited in court approximately two hours. 
And uh, when I got upstairs, I seen a lawyer that spoke to me for five minutes, and he told me that the complaining witness was not outside. Now, I haven't had a hearing. I haven't seen the people that hold a complaint against me or anything. Now, I didn't see no complaining in the court, but I did have my witnesses there. Now, if I ask my witnesses to come to court again, they probably ain't gonna come because they, they lost a day of work for nothing. You understand what I'm saying? I had three witnesses to waste days from their jobs to come down to the court to speak for me in my behalf, and uh, they didn't even get a chance to say anything. Matter of fact, they didn't even get a chance to wave at me because they kept telling me, turn around, turn around, don't look back, turn around. You know what I mean? And uh, I, now, now, how do you think that they're going to feel when I go to trial and I ask them to come into the trial, which is going to take maybe four or five, maybe six months from now? They're going to say, man, they ain't taking down another day off and work for what? They don't want to see me. They didn't look at me, you know, say nothing to me before. So, I mean, you know, that's the way it went. Anybody want to go to sick call? Bring it out the B side gate. Be the first and last call on a sick call. You ever shoot anything? Often? No. What's it all? See that? What's it all? Any temperature? Chills? Yes. Here, put your shirt. Okay, Harold, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. We're gonna give you some Donatol, okay? It should settle your stomach down a little bit. I give it to you twice a day, all right? I give you some Maalox for the nausea that probably stops some of your diarrhea. You're just gonna have to try to eat a little bit of something. And then, you know, little by little, you'll get over this. Harold, you've been through this before. You know, that's what it takes. What can I tell you? You know that. Okay. All right. So I'll mark it all down. I'll call you and I'll give it to you, all right? One of the big problems is a lot of these people have had practically no medical care previously to coming here. And uh, as far as the people on drugs go, Usually they have a host of physical problems, but they've never really manifested themselves very much because they're always, you know, strung out on drugs. So, you know, when they get here, then they sort of, after they detoxified, you know, they find out that they have, you know, high blood pressure or diabetes or this or that or the other thing. What, uh, why are you with sick all today? I got stabbed in a block last night. You know, they had these phony shakedowns, you know. Now I'm the third person that got stabbed in that block. You know, why? You know, and it's just a shame, you know. The inmates decoy the police to another area, and I get stabbed in another area. You see? And it's not right. Now, the way I was, the way I was stabbed to get 18 stitches in my mouth, it could have been 18 stitches in my throat. Now it is, now it is. Alex Robinson, to the eighth in the front, Hector Santiago. Well, I went to see the psych, you know. I told him that I ain't had no problems, and he just said he was going to keep me, you know. And that's wrong, man. If I ain't got no problems, I posted and went back to Four Black that day, right? And they didn't send me. Was there back. some incident that caused it? Yeah, I took my clothes off. Not regularly, I tore them up, you know? Mm -hmm. That's how come I got these greens now, you know? Do you know why they put you on this block? Well, I was put on this block because uh, 
of things that was on my record, what I did in jail, you know, prison. Like there was a little uh, violence sometimes, and uh, they put you in here for observation. What, what form of treatment do you receive here? Well, I just received medications, and uh, that's, what, that's about it. It's just psychiatrist, medications, and just, just lay around. So you got sick men in here, men that are really sick, and uh, you try to do your job the right way so that uh, none of these men in here cut themselves or hang themselves or jump off the tears and whatnot, what have you. And uh, you're hampered because you bring the problems to the officers. The officers either don't care about the men or they don't have time for it. And then when the psychologist or the psychiatrist do speak to the men here, it's for a five minute thing and they're always ready to with the medication. They put the medication up there in front of them, they give them the medication, no help. No help. They have chemotherapy, in other words, uh, uh, tranquilizers, Thorazine, Cinequan, uh, Librium for alcoholics. Uh, a number of the inmates that um, if I hold them in our mental observation section, they probably should, in fact, be transferred to a mental observation hospital, someplace where they have treatment. We do not have treatment here. The only thing I've been taking is some uh, yellow pills and some brown pills. I don't even know what they, they cause, you know? They don't tell me nothing. Until they give me my right for medication, I'm not taking nothing else, you know? But that's, that's all they want you to go to sleep in this motherfucker here, you know? It's just like taking a mass of people and saying, well, so many is going to get this, and so many is going to get this here, and we're going to hope that they're all better when the medication wears off. But in the meantime, they're going through these court processes. They can't put up a proper defense for themselves in the court. They can't even relate to their attorneys. Nobody wants to take the pains. Nobody cares. Is a human life, is that the value that they place on a human life, regardless of the man's stature? Come on, Molly, get in the house. If we've got 1,500 inmates here today, which I'm sure we have, I doubt if there's 150 that are in on murder. I would say a good, strong 50% of the cases that we have here are, are minor crimes that have a serious connotation that are connected with drug and alcohol mis misuse. Are all of you detoxing here? Yes, sir. That yes, means sir. you're all going through withdrawal right now. Yes, sir. When, when are you going to see a doctor next? Uh, we don't know. Sink. They don't have no toilet in this place here Sink. where we are just now. No stink, smell. It's very bad, very bad. You can't be standing here, man. This is, this is unreal, man. For hours at a time, it's too far, man. I was being sick, man. Our bowels be busting and shit, man. Our pit be peeing on us, all kinds of stuff, man. We need a bath. We need to be next to a bath. We need to be in a hospital somewhere. How did you expect a person to change to the world is? Now you tell me.
how long do you normally wait here in this room? Here, about two, about three hours. In this room? Something like that. That's, that's how much I waited the first time. You gotta carry the baby on lines, and he gets heavy, and you gotta bring things for him to eat. And it's a real hassle, you know? They make you wait just as long as if you were by yourself. Only you gotta carry the baby and diapers and everything else, and it's a real hassle. You know, I think they try and discourage you from coming, you know, and making you wait so long. is on her way over here now. Yes, as a matter of fact, yes, my wife is on her way over here. Last time she came, uh, she uh, arrived at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, I arrived uh, uh, up front. I got to see her at, uh, I think it was 7 o'clock, and she left the island at about 8, 8.30 in the evening. George Rivera. This whole system is set up, right? The more that you put a man through, right? The more that you take from him, right? And I don't mean in the sense of just his confinement in here. I mean the sense of his personal relationships with his family, right? That means that you drive a man to a point where he says, well, to, to avoid this, I'll take what the court wants to give me, right? See, all of it correlates together. There is certainly an attitude of despair and depression and fear in the house of detention for men. That itself is a coercive effect to do something to get out of there. An officer can apply for a transfer. An inmate can't. An officer uh, can take a sick day. An inmate can't. But an inmate can cop a plea to get out, and some do. So in that sense, it probably affects uh, the disposition of, of justice. The judges have seen that those judges who do dispose of a good many cases, who do get into plea bargaining and in getting many pleas from defendants, these are the judges who are recognized by the administrators of the court as judges of the kind they would like to see. And we have had judges in this court, I am ashamed to say, who are so interested in a disposition rate and disposing of the largest number of cases in the shortest period of time, that they have actually called defendants up to the bench and said, if you will plead guilty, I will parole you or release you on your own recognizance until the date of sentence. If you don't plead guilty, your bail is $5,000, well knowing that that defendant could not possibly meet that kind of imposition. In any case where there's a possible sentence of probation, uh, given the lack of criminal record by the defendant or perhaps the offense itself being not that serious, a defendant who's in jail is much less likely to get probation than someone who's not in jail. Uh, a, a defendant who is uh, in jail, uh, right along the line, will be offered time where the same person, if you're out, will be offered a probation if he pleads guilty. Uh, the jury sees a man in custody, and it's rather hard to keep that from him, although an effort is made. If, if you're on trial and the man's in custody, it's impossible to keep that fact from the jury. Well, that's, that's, half, the battle, that's half the DA's battle right there, if the jury knows that he's in jail, rather than at liberty while the case is pending. Well, I think it's probably fair to say that a person in jail will think more about pleading and think about it more intensively than a person who is out on bail who's content to have that situation remain static and let time pass. 
So I think it's clearly true that an incarcerated defendant is under greater pressure than a bail defendant. I will tell you like my lawyer just told me today, today I had a counsel visit. He says, bullshit, there is no justice. And I quote him, this is what he said, bullshit, there is no justice. He once believed in justice. I told him I did also. He says, the best thing you can do is try to negotiate for what you can and get right on out. If I did have any kind of court help, I wouldn't uh, feel so bad about being in here. I, I, I feel like I'm being helped. But since I'm not being helped, uh, it could drive a person up the wall. Now, I can control myself to the point where uh, I'm still stable and mind-wise so far. But uh, I know I can't continue this way for long. And maybe that is part of reasons why people do hang themselves in here. For instance, you know, uh, it's awful to think of it because uh, a person can be driven, you know, wild right out their mind, you know, with, without seeing anybody or I can imagine how many other inmates here feel the same way like I do. Some don't have visitors, some uh, come from foreign countries and they can't speak very good English and things like this is needed to help these kind of people and nobody seems to be getting that type of help. All right, this is your receipt. He goes back to court, 41778 part AP1 Bronx, okay. all right? When our men so our friends get involved in trouble, I think we women are supposed to suffer because we're supposed to be looking for this money to come and build them out, number one, and then if we got a job, it's easy for us to lose our jobs just because taking one day off. And then if the people, the company are busy and they needed us, they're gonna call somebody else and we're gonna lose our jobs. And then we're not gonna be able to pay this money. Well, but I made it, he's my friend and he's out already. And that was count. He's a father of three kids. He's a married man, he got a family to support and I'm not doing it because I want him in the street. I'm doing it because he is a father who's supposed to go and work and provide to support his family. I've been here in this country for about 18 years, and I'm working 16. Only I have about, couple, about two, two years without working, lay off. But I'm working, man. I work for many companies here in this country. Then uh, if I find a job, I'm working right away. Show sure this. A, a, a middle class.
middle-class person is arrested for, let's say, a robbery. He's held on a $5,000 bail. He gets out on bail. He hires an attorney. That attorney knows that in order for this person to qualify for probation, he must establish roots in the community. He must establish a program that's going to deal with this man's problems. Right? A poor man doesn't have that ability, and he's assigned counsel. And assigned counsel very rarely, very, very rarely, will ever, excuse me, um, look to the outside, to various agencies, for instance, like the task force, all right, to see if there's a service available to treat that man's problem and keep him on probation, keep him in the community, rather than to send him off to state prison, which is where the problems are then compounded. All right? And we will deal with that person uh, probably again and again and again, whereas many of the people who are placed on probation and given that shot at life, as we call it, um, very often don't go back to prison and no longer continue to commit crime. So there are other approaches, and I think that the railroad, when you talk about railroading, um, is designed for poor people. And unfortunately, when, when you say that, you're also talking about the black and Hispanic populations because they, they bear the brunt right, of the poverty, certainly in this city and in this state. To some extent, a bail system in which a person's freedom to some degree depends on the amount of money he has appears irrational and unfair. Uh, we keep it not because we're aware, not because we're unaware of the irrationality and the unfairness, but because we have di difficulty in devising a system that is preferable. If I were to point to uh, the cause of this kind of condition, I would point to the administrative judges from the highest level on down to the man who administers the court system in the city, David Ross, who seems to have devised a system which gives rewards to those who dispose of the greatest number of cases in the shortest period of time. And that's dispensing with justice, in my view. It diminishes courts to arenas where you play the numbers game. And every week, we get a sheet published by the administrative uh, section of the court telling us how many cases were taken in, how many were disposed of, and what one's batting average is. Uh, how many were sentenced, how many were dismissed, how many were tried, and that sort of thing. And to me, that deprives the court of the dignity to which it's entitled. It's no longer a temple of justice. The noise, and the bustle reminds you of Newgate, when there's a picnic at a hanging and inspired Lenny Bruce, as you know, to say that in the halls of justice, justice is in the halls. When I was 17 years old, I wanted to join, I went to join the armed forces. I, I committed what I thought was a, a big crime. I, I had a misdemeanor against me. So I went, I got dressed, I put on a suit and a tie, and I went to the Air Force, and, to the Air Force recruiter station. I said, uh, I'd like to join the Air Force. They told me I couldn't, I had a misdemeanor. I went home, I changed my mind again, I went to the Marines. I told them I, I, I'd like to do something out of my life, could they let me join? I they told me I couldn't, I had a, a misdemeanor. And then now looking back at all these years, you know, all they've taught me is that it's not don't do crime, I'm sorry, it's not don't do crimes, it's don't get caught. Don't get caught, do it, plan it, do like, do like the fellas in the courtroom. Everything they do is guarded and pre-thought and pre-planned. They are, they, we are the examples, Watergate, Nixon. These, these are our examples. You know, they get away, the, 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 the justice system. These, these are our examples. A uh, Haldeman, uh, uh, John Mitchell spends uh, furloughs in the hospital till his time is up. Uh, all, these, all these characters, these, you know, then they tell us, you know, uh, justice, justice. No, it's not justice. It's, you know, it's unfortunate that you got caught. Better luck next time. We do have legal rights and we're not getting them. 85 to 90 percent of the population in this institution is black and Hispanic. You know? But we are a minority on the outside, but we load your jails up as a majority. So where's the equality of the law for us? $5,000 for nothing, I ain't get. I talk to the DA, to, to the legal aid. Legal aid don't tell nothing to the jails. I got a family, I got my son, I got my woman, I sprang it. He don't know nothing, he don't care. He don't care about it that. You know, I got my job, I lose my job for that shit, everything. Well, I got someone taking care of my apartment and my dog. And uh, that's a part of my government disability, someone taking care of that, you know. But on the other thing, on the other side, I have, I've been, I've been, been with Jesus for a while. I've been seeking Jesus. 
so I have a little peace. Some people that, that's over here, and they, can, they can aggravate the COs or the judge or, you know, and, and justice never prevails. You know, they just lost in the system. They're just here. I just hope that I can hold my level and keep a calm head and don't get excited so that I don't get lost in this system because the system is, is designed so that, you know, they can just keep a person here as long as they feel he belongs here, not as long as he deserved to be here. You know, and that's, that's where it's at, you know. Yeah, that's my most fear there, being lost in this system.